because I think as I'm thinking about the manager or leader who's listening to this, mm -hmm. they're saying to themselves, I need to balance spending in individually getting to know each person mm -hmm. and, and, and really being sensitive to each person, but also creating consistency and commonality for everybody. This is the Brandon Smith Show, and of course, I'm your host, Brandon Smith, and the entire purpose of this show is one singular thing, and that's to help you live a life that much more free from dysfunction. So our topic today is a really, really important one, and from my experience working with teams, I'm finding it to be increasingly important and increasingly difficult, and that is the challenge of managing teams and building teams that are both diverse and inclusive. And frankly, what does that even mean? So to help us on this journey, I get the absolute pleasure. Aren't I, aren't I setting you up so well? Yes, Melanie? I know. It's a huge bar you're setting for me. Of, of having my guest on the show to be Melanie Miller. Melanie, I'm so so glad to have you on the show. Thank so you for I, having me. I know you are, you are an inclusion strategist, which I just love that title. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I told you I was going to add a subtitle, and that is Ambassador of Storytelling, which I like that subtitle because to me, when you talked about it, it represents that you want to be able to share other people's stories and share those stories that are important for us to be aware of, even if maybe they're not comfortable sharing it, to be able to put voice to that in a mm -hmm. confidential way, naturally. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to take on this idea of inclusion and diversity and mm -hmm. to give a little background, like I've gotten a chance to see you work in several different settings and I'm so impressed with how you handle this conversation because I think it's a challenging one. It's, it's one that we all want to take on, um, at least most of us do, hopefully all of us do, um, but it's also a, a sensitive one. Mm -hmm. So um, before we jump into maybe some of the themes that you've seen over the last year and questions people have kind of posed to you, um, I would love to hear a little bit more about your story. So how did you get doing this? I am a very odd bird in this field. A lot of folks in this field come out of a, a psychology or sociology background. I come out of sales, marketing, and advertising. Hmm. So I'm a very, very odd bird. I was working for an ad agency. I'd been in sales and, and marketing for many years. Um, I was working for an ad agency. I was the director of new business development. And one of the two partners stuck his head in my office on a Friday and said, uh, you'll need to take home all your personal items today because there's going to be a padlock on the door on Monday. And then he left. And I remember sitting there thinking, well, what in the world does that mean? Are we going to jail? Is that a bad thing? I, I don't even know. And luckily, a girlfriend that I work with uh, came into my office and she said, did he come in here? And I said, yes. Did he tell you? Yes. I said, are we going to jail? Is it like, what, what's going on? She said, no, it usually means bankruptcy. I said, no. I said, I'm director of new business development. We have clients, we're billing clients, they're paying us. That's the right cycle. It's working the way it's supposed to work. So there's no way it's bankruptcy, no. Um, well, long story short, my check never cashed and um, they filed bankruptcy and there indeed was a padlock on the door on Monday. And I sat home for the next three months watching soap operas and eating Fritos with French onion dip on my sofa. Is that, is that, is that a good combination? It was an way? amazing com That and the I'm Young and the Restless? Not. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was totally fantastic. Uh, and I got a call one day from a buddy who said, do you have a job yet? I said, no, but I need one because I'd save some money, but I knew I couldn't do that indefinitely. Um, he said, a friend of mine owns a diversity consulting firm. You should call him. He's looking for new consultants. And I said, thank you so very much, but I don't know anything about consulting and the whole stocks and bonds and municipality things with numbers I'm really bad with. So I don't think I'm a good candidate. And he said, yeah, it's not that kind of diversity. You should call him. So I did. And three interviews later, they hired me. I spent the next six months understanding what the imposter syndrome really means mm -hmm. because I was looking over my shoulder every day waiting for security to come haul me out. If I felt they were going to find out, I had no idea what I was doing and I didn't know what I was doing. I don't know to this day really why they hired me, but they kept saying, we can teach you what you need to know. So I was with them about six-ish years, and then I went out on my own, and I won't say when, but I'll say I've been in this field for at least 20 years. Wow. So that's how it all started back in the day. Yeah, and, and this has become more and more of an important topic for, for folks for various reasons. Yeah, back in the day, people, I would hear people say things like, oh, this is wonderful, you're in the money space. And I said, what do you mean? They said, this is, this is where everything's going. This is where all the money's happening today. 
And I said, I'm, that's not why I'm in this. I, I'm in this because I really believe in this. And I, I think it's the right thing to do. And more importantly, the very first project I did for that company that, that took a chance on me and hired me um, was a project that to this day I can point to and say, you know what, this stuff works. It was a 16-week program. Most organizations really, I don't think I have the, the time or bandwidth to do this anymore. But uh, it was a 16-week program. We started with a diversity class, as it were, back on a, it was a Tuesday. And then on Wednesday and Thursday, the people who taught the class would actually shadow the participants of the class and they'd reinforce everything we would teach them on Tuesday. And then the following Tuesday for 16 weeks, every topic was something under the umbrella of diversity and inclusion. So conflict resolution through the lens of diversity and inclusion, team building through the lens of diversity and inclusion. And so it just continued to build. And it was really an amazing, an amazing practice. And we, we saw engagement go up we saw grievances go down it was a unionized environment it was really it was a magical experience and it gave me what i needed that propelled me the the whole rest of my career because while it started back in the day uh it's just continued the whole idea of diversity and inclusion has really gained traction and you turn on the news today anywhere you you read a blog you see a, you, you hear a podcast and the topic continues to come up and it's still a very important one inside organizations yeah so that is a good segue to now. So today, when you think back on the last year or so, what are maybe some of those common either questions that people just keep, seem to keep asking you or themes that seem to keep popping up? What are, what are some of those? Well, one I hear a lot is, I think we need more diversity. Can you come help us? And when I start talking to them, I find out they don't really need more diversity. They want to find out how do we how do we build inclusion inside our organization? What do we do? Because our main goal is to whatever their business mission is, right? And that's what it should be. They're they're there to fulfill the objectives of their organization and and absolutely that is supported. But if they could figure out a way to build a more inclusive culture, they actually will have employees that are more engaged. They're more productive, they're more creative, they're more innovative, all the, the things we want people to be when they show up at work and doggone it, they actually end up being happier human beings, which is a nice ripple effect to take home. So um, that's what they're really looking for. And I have found in my entire career, everybody wants the, give me the top 20 things to do and I'll just leave and do it. And to build an inclusive culture where people feel like they're valued and respected and they feel like they belong, which is different than feeling like you fit oftentimes. And I'll give the example of, is your culture, does it tend to reward and recognize more extrovert behavior or introvert behavior? And people will hesitate, but they'll say, well, extrovert. In pockets, it might be introverts based on who your leader is, but overall extrovert. Yes, that's true. U.S. culture does tend to reward and recognize more extrovert behavior. But then I ask if I'm an introvert and if I'm a strong introvert, can I be successful in your business culture? And it's interesting to me how long that pause is between when I ask the question and when they give me an answer. Ultimately, people will say yes. My follow on then is, for me to be successful here, what do I have to do if I'm a strong introvert living in your extrovert world? What will it take mm. for me to show up and be successful living in this world of extrovert? And long story short, they usually say you have to fake it. You have to play extrovert all day. And the bottom line to that is it's exhausting. Yeah, that's right. really hard. Yeah. So, okay. So then if we think about the a listener right now mm -hmm. um, and they've got you know a, a team of people underneath her or him. How can they foster an environment that feels more inclusive? How do they foster that environment of more sense of kind of belonging? First of all, they have to be clear on what they want to get out of it. Like, why do you want to have a culture of belonging? So they need to have a, a clear dotted line to what I call their own business case. Like, what are your, your what? How will it help your business if your team is like this? So, you know, give give yourself a bullseye. What am I What am I headed towards? And then you've got to individualize your team, right? You know, this uh, working with leaders. I've got to figure out what makes each person tick when we think about things. Um, Another question I'm often asked is, how do I mitigate bias? How do I get that out of my workplace? And I don't know anybody in the world that's completely bias free. So I don't have the list for that yet. I have a few hacks I can help with. Um, but one of the things is you start to think about from a leader perspective, I know I'm supposed to give feedback to my team, for example. Well, oftentimes leaders will give feedback the same way they like to receive feedback. And it never even crosses their mind. Oh, I wonder if somebody on my team might actually like it differently. It's worked great for me. So my unconscious assumption is well, it will work great for everybody on my team. Well, it may not. Do you have the conversation? 
or do you just stick that in your back pocket and then hope what I'm doing works? Right. So it's, it's really peeling back those layers of each employee to find out you know, what motivates them. What's their preferred communication style? How do you like to receive feedback? What what motivates you? How do you like to be recognized and rewarded? And so, so it's like it starts. It sounds like it starts with figuring out what's that goal that you're trying to go for. Mm-hmm. Why do you want this sense of belonging or inclusion? And then it's just, it's both simple and difficult because it's time consuming. Mm-hmm. But you need to go down the path of just getting to know individually each team member. Yeah. How do they like feedback? What works best for them? What doesn't work for them? And try and find an approach that is going to honor some of that as, as much as you can. Yes. Yes, there's a woman named Susan Scott, and she gives great little nuggets of wisdom in her books. Uh, And one of the ones that I will never forget is she said, you should ask your folks in an informal setting. So, Brandon, tell me, what's the single most important thing I need to know about you to be a better leader for you? Mm. And then zip the lip and let the person answer your question. She says, now, you should be prepared for them to say, like, seriously, you really want to know? Yeah, I really want to know. I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer would be. She says, push back and say, well, if you did know, what would it be? If you did know, what would it be? She said, if you want, try it at home with your spouse or your partner at home one night. Honey, where would you like to go for dinner? I don't know. Well, if you did know, where would it be? I don't know. I like that. But if you did know, okay, okay, Italian or Chinese, (laughs) you decide. All right, I'll go with Italian. But at least you get your toe in the water practicing. If you did know, what what would it be? What would it be? I love that. That's beautiful. (laughs) Um, Okay, so, all right, so we talked a little bit about kind of one of those big themes that you, you hear is about folks saying, I want more diversity and what they really want is more inclusion, that Mm -hmm. sense of belonging. Uh, What's maybe another theme, another theme or question or challenge you've seen pop up over the last year? Well, unconscious bias is a hot topic right now. In the last, I would say three years, I've really seen the wave get bigger and bigger and bigger Mm. with organizations saying, please come in, talk to us about unconscious bias. And when I say, why do you think you need somebody to talk to you about unconscious bias? They say, well, because I just think that would be good for our business. And they don't really know where it would connect, how it would connect. So sometimes part of what I do is to, to build that front piece, the business connection again. Um, how does this, you know, unconscious bias in and of itself is really the largest impediment to inclusion. So if you have an organization that's been working and building capacity for, for driving inclusion inside the organization for years, they may be doing a great job. They may be looking at it from the perspective of not just their, their human capital, but also my policies, my procedures, which they should be looking at, right? So how are my policies, procedures, um, activities, how, how, how does that have a diversity link or what is the connection there? And the classic example I'll oftentimes share there is, you know, back in the day when I first started, the big topic was around different benefits we can offer our employees, domestic partner benefits. Mm. And so companies started doing it. I was working and I'm gonna speak out of school that was in the news, so I'm not uh, sharing company secrets, but IBM at the time uh, where I was working gave some great examples of how this played out. They said, you know what? We have uh, an employee base that has a broad range of sexual orientations and we want every human being that works here to have an equal access to medical insurance. So we will offer domestic partner benefits. So their intent there was for it to be for people of same sex and same sex relationships. But then they had a large number of employees say, well, wait a minute, I'm in an opposite sex relationship with a domestic partner. Why can't I take a hold of this? And they thought about it and they said, you know what, you can. So they broadened their policy based on their diversity. Mm. And then after the domestic partner, the Marriage Equality Act passed a few years back, we saw this, the pendulum swing back. So policies went back to your medical insurance is for you and your spouse. Whoever your spouse is, is your spouse, is your choice if you want to get married. But that is the, the policy we will offer. So we've seen diversity and inclusion connect to different policies and procedures, as, and it should. Um, but then we start to look at, again, this whole unconscious bias piece. So how does that filter into policy? How does it filter into how I lead? There's software um, around, there's a lot of, of um, study and research that's been done around resume bias, just mm. based on your name. In the United States, and for years, different groups have been doing the same survey. We've not seen a lot of movement, but we'll send out the exact same resume, half have white sounding names, half have ethnic sounding names, and the white sounding named resumes are the ones that tend to get the calls back first. So if you're a Matthew or a Brandon or a Alice, you're probably gonna get a call back before Jamal, Kanisha, Muhammad, or Quay. There's a, yeah. a, a there's actually a great clip on YouTube by a guy named Jose Zamora. He talks his, his story, he talks about he lost his job, he put his resume together, sent it out to 
tons, I don't know exactly how many, a hundred, we'll say, different places, got zero response. He says, I had an idea one night to take the S out of my first name. So I changed it to Joe Zamora, only change I made on my resume, sent it back to the same companies, and within something like 10 days, he had seven job offers or so. It was wacky. Wow. It was unbelievable. So check that out in your free time. Jose Zamora on YouTube. Yeah. So, okay. So unconscious bias. So I want to, so I, I noticed we're at break. When we come back from that, I would love to get maybe a couple hacks from you. Well, what are some things we can do? Because to your point, we all have unconscious bias. Yeah. So what are ways to kind of acknowledge it and maybe do something about it, do something about it, short circuit yes. it, something, or, or at least see it so we can make choices. I like it. Okay. Sounds like a good plan. Okay. So st stay tuned. We'll be right back. Here's your coaching minute for the week presented to you by the Leadership Foundry. Dysfunction in the workplace, it's a pervasive problem. Here's a simple tip to eliminate dysfunction both in your team, but even in the environments around you. Clarify your team members' roles, goals, and responsibilities. So just spend some time thinking about, does all of my team know? Does each of them know what their role is, what the goals are of the team, and their responsibilities? If the answer is yes, you right there eliminate 50% of the, all the dysfunction that could come up in your team. If the answer is no, think about how you could do that better. When we don't do that, one of two things happens. Either people overlap work and they step on each other's toes, or you have one person carrying much bigger load while a couple other people are hanging out not doing near as much work. It's one of the big problems in the nonprofit world is a lack of clarity around roles, goals, and responsibilities. So focus on those three things, and I promise you, not only will you eliminate dysfunction, it's going to make your workplace that much more enjoyable. Uh, welcome back from break. Uh, of course, this is the Brandon Smith Show. And and going into break, this show, we've been talking about diversity and inclusion. And Melanie, I, I, I kind of set this challenge for you kind of going into break that, yeah, we absolutely all have unconscious bias and it can get in the way and it can do things that are maybe less than healthy or maybe even destructive. But what are some good hacks for us to either recognize those or overcome those? Excellent question. And if I could come up with like the top 10 list on that, that would be amazing. But research, that would be amazing. wouldn't it? I would be so rich. It would be great. <laughs> uh, I was recently asked, when are you going to retire? I said, I don't want to retire. Like I want to, like, I really do believe in what I do. Uh, so here's what I know so far. There is more and more research showing. And it's one of my favorite new hacks, if you will, this whole idea of perspective taking is such, it has such a huge impact on people. So I can tell you, I have a great idea. Uh, I can ask you, do you here's a, a person I just hired. Do you think I used any bias in, in hiring this person? What do you think? Nine times out of 10, when we ask somebody that question, we tend to ask someone that's kind of like us. Um, and guess what their answer probably is? It's probably reaffirming to whatever I came up with originally, mm. because you're like me and you think like me. But it's not until we really broaden that and start talking to people and, and, and having relationships across diversity, if you will, difference, um, that we really do get to see the world from a, a different way. I love the quote, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Mm. I believe that, and I think perspective taking allows for that. I'll give you a couple examples of what I mean. Um, just this week I was with a client, and there was a woman who uh, spoke with a heavy Spanish accent. I could hear her and understand her fine. She shared with me her, her badge at work. She said, do you see my name badge? I said, yes. And she, I said, tell me, like, why are you showing me that? And she said, well, my last name, her first name was Sarah. She said, my last name, well, um, I don't remember exactly. It was something like Rivera Montañez or something. And she said, that was my maiden name. She said, but this is my um, married name. I'm divorced, but I'm keeping that because I know if I went with my maiden name, I'd never get a job. I wow. said, why do you think that? She said, because if you put that on a resume, nobody's going to ask me to come in. She said, I've had it happen to me. So that reinforces that whole resume bias thing, right? She also talked about her own accent and how she uses that to withhold her own information at work. She won't give her ideas. She sits back in meetings. She doesn't really contribute verbally. She said she'll email things and different ideas. So she doesn't really contribute. And she said, I just sit back and I ask her, even in the room, I said, would you mind sharing this with your colleagues? She said, no, 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 definitely not. Mm. And in, unless you're walking in those shoes, it's kind of hard to, I mean, I could hypothesize what it might be like for someone in those positions. But... Um, 
I don't really know unless I hear the story. So if I'm talking to someone who speaks English as a second language, that's a different challenge. I don't have that challenge. I like to say I do speak two languages. I speak English and Southernese. <laughs> um, some folks get that. Thank you for laughing. Um, and so I, those are those are the, the ones I have. But if you're someone, I had a gentleman in a session a while back who was Chinese, and he said, you know what, when you talk to me in English, I hear you in English. I translate that to Chinese. I formulate my response in Chinese. I translate that back to English, and then I give it to you. He said, but in the seconds that it takes me to do all this multiple translation in my head in that space, people make a lot of assumptions about me. They think I am. And he went through this list of lack of technical competence, poor English language skills, et cetera, et cetera. He said, and they have no clue I'm doing all this. And he said, it's just exhausting to have to do this mental calculus all the time. He said, with, with really not ever having the opportunity to talk to other people about how it plays out. Yeah. So again, the perspective taking is huge. Or recently I was speaking with a woman, an African-American woman who was talking about how she spent so much time questioning herself. Can I wear my hair naturally to work? Can I wear my hair naturally to work? I look around, I don't see other black women that do, so I don't know if I can. And she said she tried it, and she said she'd worn it a couple of times and didn't, didn't have any issues with it. She said until about a few weeks ago, she said her manager, they were getting ready for a big pitch with a client. And he asked her, he said, you set, you're ready to go? She said, yep, I'm ready. And he goes, you are, you're gonna do something else with your hair, right? Mm. Wow, I've never had anyone ask me that about mine. So this idea of perspective taking, it really does allow you to see the world differently. So, so it, that's the way. Is it about asking their stories or their perspectives? Is that really how we get there? So particularly if I'm a leader, I've got to, it's gotta be just be normative behavior that I'm, I'm asking those kinds of questions. But if I don't have relationship with my team, if I, there's not trust there, it's gonna be hard to just jump into that. So I need to build some on the front, build some trust and relationship on the front end. And one of the great ways to do that is to divulge a little bit about me. Maybe some struggles I've had or some places that I've, you know, had done some of that mental yeah, cause, calculus cause about you're, something. Because you're really asking about vulnerability. Yeah. And you're asking yes, someone yes. to be very vulnerable yes. about something that they're, that they're very sensitive about. Yes, absolutely. And so to say, hey, will you go ahead and put that on the table? That super sensitive thing <laughs> sure. that, that you really don't want to talk about? Right. You know, sometimes. <laughs> to, to your to, boss, by the way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Person <laughs> has a direct relationship to the check signature, right? Um, and I know you've heard me talk about some organizations where you use the analogy of the iceberg for diversity, and they talk about how you know the, about 10 to 7% to of an iceberg is usually exposed above the water line. And we say those are some dimensions of diversity. I might be able to make a guesstimate about someone as soon as they walk in the room. So I could guess what I think is your race, your ethnicity, um, your sex, maybe your gender identity, maybe if you have a physical disability or visible one that I could see that, um, and that's about it. Other than that, everything else about you I wouldn't know unless I engaged in conversation and dialogue with you. I don't know if you're married, if you're in a relationship, unless you tell me. I don't know what your religious beliefs are unless you tell me. If you have children, are they human or furry, right? I don't know any of that unless you divulge that to me. And so I like to use the, the water line on that iceberg to represent how included and respected someone feels. So if I'm feeling valued and included and like I belong, all that good stuff we talked about, I'm going to be more comfortable lowering that water line. So yeah. I will talk to you about it. But if you haven't made me feel that way, I'm not going to share with you. So, um, as you think about any other big themes or questions that you've gotten posed with over the last year? Um, I've gotten questions around some of the big social movements on the outside of a workplace that inevitably does come inside the workplace because, of course, yeah. in any industry anywhere, my employee base is a microcosm of society. So when we see the big movements like the Me Too movement, yeah. um, the, the ending gun violence movement, those kinds of things, especially for the youngest generation, um, the, the idea of this, this social connection has so much more power for them coming into the workplace. Not all, but some, 55% or more, I don't want to stereotype. Um, but those types of things do start to bleed into organizations and organizations are having a tough time figuring out how to have conversations about that. What do we do about that? Um, politics these days has been become very taboo because it's caused a lot of tension, diversity tension in the workplace. There's one organization I work with that in their corporate cafeteria, when you came in, they would have flat screen TVs on the wall. They used to have half would be on CNN, half would be on Fox. Nobody paid attention until in the last 18 months, 
you may come there for a business meeting, you come through the cafeteria line, you're just looking for a seat somewhere to sit down, you sit down, you eat, you leave. What you don't know is the people who are observing you notice which TV you sat near. They then assume a political affiliation oh, based geez. on which TV you oh, sat next to. No. And so people started shutting down in meetings. They wouldn't talk to each other. They would get into arguments. Got a simple solution, Sesame Street. HGTV is now on every screen in that corporate <laughs> cafeteria, yes. But that, because again, especially for many folks in the younger generation, there's such a connection and organizations are try, trying to figure it out now. How do we have these difficult conversations around things like race, um, and, um, sexual harassment in the workplace, um, generational difference? We, we started that a few years ago and everybody assumed they knew what a millennial meant. Uh, and then they, they, they had a little challenge with that in a lot of places, but there are a lot of folks doing great things. I yeah. work with another organization that is hiring in a lot of Gen Zs, or I like to call them iGens, like an iPhone, right? The lowercase i, capital G. Mm -hmm. um, and they're putting them in early leadership roles and they're doing amazing and brilliant things. So they're struggling, but they're getting there. So uh, I know we're getting close on time. So I'm gonna share with you something that uh, I was doing a workshop and this was for a company, as a technology company. And they asked me to come in and do a little um, a little talk piece in the morning with one of their special interest groups. So this technology company created a bunch of special interest groups. And one of their special interest groups was based on age. And so this special interest group was all their technology employees, and it's a technology company, who are 40 and older. Wow. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So this was, and, and I'm not gonna share the, the witty name that they coined themselves, but it had something to do with like gray hair kind of idea. Okay, okay. Like we're okay. the old bunch. Okay? Uh-huh, okay. And it was about a thousand employees in the whole company. This group, they were really proud they had gotten like 60 people, 70 people, right? So it's not a, a large percentage. And while I was doing the workshop, we were talking about some of the challenges of being an older employee, mm -hmm. using air quotes, mm -hmm. in an environment that's very tech technologically savvy, yeah, but that has nothing to do with being an older employee, but also a useful uh, group with maybe uses more social media to communicate rather mm -hmm. than uh, email, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the individuals, uh, African-American male, he, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, when I grew up and I served some time in the military too, he said, we were, my experience of growing up was we were always looking for reasons to be more similar to each other. Mm -hmm. It seems like today we're looking for more reasons of why we're different. And I thought that was really interesting. I don't know if that's something you've seen, and if that is true, how do, is that a good thing? Is that something we need to try and change? Because I think as I'm thinking about the manager or leader who's listening to this, mm -hmm. they're saying to themselves, I need to balance spending in individually getting to know each person mm -hmm. and, and, and really being sensitive to each person, but also creating consistency and commonality for everybody. Um, and how do, I, how do I do that? Uh, because that is a, that's, a, that's a hard balance. Yeah. Yes. So how do I balance the individual and the collective? So another so take, word. Take that on, <laughs> Melody. <laughs> Great. Um, another word we're hearing a lot about in this space today is called intersectionality. Um, so I can be. Intersectionality. Intersectionality. So as my diversity dimensions intersect. I've never heard this word before. I'm intersectionality. Glad I could offer you something a little new today. Yeah, so I could be, it could be. Um, I could be a black female Muslim woman. Yes. And that combination in and of itself in the workplace can can cause me to have a different experience than somebody sitting next to me. Um, pick any three, right? And so how each human being identifies themselves. Is it always three or, or you uh, just... Two, three, four it could be It could be whatever that intersection. So yes. circles kind of connecting like a little Venn diagram kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. But if you ask people like what what is something about you that's very important to how you see the world and how does that play out for you at work? Um, it's amazing the stories you'll get, uh, but it all, it's all connected back to as a, um, a young first time mother, people have a whole different experience than their colleagues oftentimes just based on those dimensions alone. Uh, so going back to your original question around, you know, it used to be we all wanna fit in, let's all be alike, and now it's people wanna stand out. Um, my response to that is people just wanna be seen for who they are. People just want to be seen. Uh, so can I see you? Like, for example, I'll have folks say, you know what? When I look out and see people, I just see human beings. I don't see color. I don't see gender. I just see people. And then they smile 
And then I smile, and then I remember the song I learned when I was five years old, Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. And the reason I hear this song in my head is because you cannot grow up into adulthood in any country's culture and not develop a, a, a lens or a filter, right, for the way you see and experience the world. It's just, it's completely impossible. So to have someone who looks different than you, regardless of who you are, right, can you see their difference? Um, can you see how their difference might cause them to have a completely different experience, not only at work, but in the world? Mm. And can you connect to them with them on that level? And so I think a lot of it's about, can, can you see me? You know, do, people say, that I, I want you to see that I'm of a different gender or a different race. If you tell me you don't see my race or my gender, it makes me feel really invisible. And some folks, quite frankly, feel even insulted by that. You, you use almost like a prompt to set that up. And I don't know if you meant to do that, but it sounded really good. <laughs> I don't even remember what I said. <laughs> it was really good. It was something like in the how um, it was trying to get at that intersectionality. It was trying to get the person to be able to kind of identify them. And um, I, don't, I don't know, something like how I see the world. How do you see the world? Or I'm trying to search for what's that easy little tactic or hack that we could equip managers with that they could ask someone that would make that an inviting and safe conversation to have. Um, you know, if you have a manageable group where you can sit with them as, as the leader, uh, if you already are doing some sort of a team building, you're, do, you're having activities with your group, so you've made some connection with them, um, sit down with them and have them share with each other first. You, but you give your example before anybody starts, right? Um, but have them share with each other what's, maybe what's, what's something about you that's important to the way you see the world and how does that impact you at work? Hmm. So you could hear a story about a new mom. You could hear a story about an older than, I'm putting air quotes around that too, right? An older than that's having a completely different experience. I'm working with an organization now where for about 12 years, they didn't do a lot of hiring. So they have a lot of, we'll say older thans and older tenure and a lot of newer thans and younger folks. And so there's sort of this classic hoarding of data if you're older than. Like I'm gonna hoard everything because if I teach you younger thans, then they're gonna get rid of me and I don't wanna leave. I'm, I'm healthy, I love what I do, I love the people I work with, I don't wanna leave. So I'm just gonna hoard everything. Well, that doesn't help anybody, right? That doesn't help them learn anything new. It doesn't help the younger thans learn what they need to know. And it certainly doesn't help the mission of the organization. So um, they're having a tough go of it. So if I'm that older than, you know, what is, how does that involve what we do on a daily basis and how does it in, involve and, and trigger my level of engagement or disengagement, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Really awesome. Thank you. It's a lot to talk about. There is so much to talk about. So I ask all my guests this question as we get close to the end. What's one life hack you have for us? A way for, to help us live our life more free from dysfunction, either personal or professional? My life hack would be this. Live your authentic self. Okay. What does that mean to you? It means be you. I've got I've I've been me my whole life. Um, and by that I mean I I early on it's not that I didn't question things in my life. What did I want to do? How did where did I want to be when I was 40, 45? And I'm gonna stop there because I'm definitely older than 45, but I'm gonna leave it at 45. Older than. Older than. Thank you. Yes, older perfect. Than. Older than. <laughs> um and I was open to, to change and how my life might change. Maybe I'm not going to live in the same place I thought I was going to live and things like that. Um, but all along the way, I can't, I was not very good like living in a box as a child. I knew it wouldn't work well as, a, as an adult. I've always been a rules girl. So I, if you tell me I have to follow these rules, I'll follow the rules. Um, but I'm going to do it based on who I am. So I am definitely an expressive person. I am definitely an extrovert. Um, so I gain energy from being around other people, not from isolation like the introverts. Um, I do things the way I do it when I give keynote speeches, when I facilitate training classes. I, I do it my way. I have my style and I can't be somebody else. I can only be me. So oh, Beautiful. So if people want to learn more about you and, and follow you, where, where can they go? They can find me on my website, which is MelanieMillerAtlanta.com. And you spell that? M-E-L-A-N-I-E. M I L L E R A T L A N T A dot com. Nice. Melanie Miller. At Atl no. Melly Miller Atlanta dot com. Okay. Okay. Yes. And then I am on um, Twitter at Melanie for Results. And you can find me on Facebook with Melanie Miller Atlanta. So you put Melanie Miller and Atlanta together, I'm sure you'll find me somewhere. Fantastic. 
keep up the awesome work you're doing. Thank in the you world. so much. Thank you for yeah. having me. This yeah, is great. this was fantastic. Time went flying by. It goes by so fast. Uh, and thank you for listening and watching. Of course, keep up the fight every week as we drop a new show uh, and continue to watch us uh, both either on YouTube, Facebook, or listen on iTunes. And if you has, haven't subscribed on iTunes, please do and rate and review the show. That's how other folks find us and we grow our tribe. So until our next show, have a great week and an awesome life. Thank you.